the Lord leads us to do it. And uh, I hope it doesn't happen here, but it has happened where, <laughs> where to prove it, the Lord proves it to the people. And, uh, I'm embarrassed. But uh, if he has to do that, it would glorify him to do that. That's the first thing. Jesus, the Son of God, said, I can't do anything. I can do nothing of myself. I think that is. You ever want to be at the Jews, maybe just trying to be a little humble? I can do nothing of myself. Right. For the simple reason that he came to us to be a man amongst men. To take the lowly position. I better read the passage concerning it first. In Ephesians and Philippians chapter 2. He starts out by exhorting the Philippian Christians to take the humble position, not to strive after anything that being glorious, to be lowly in mind, considering others, and uh, being concerned for the welfare of others. And then he says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, had it not robbery to be equal with God? I never come across a passage in the authorized version like this. And I, I use the authorized version, but God never allowed any man or any group of men to make an absolutely perfect translation. So I don't object to uh, certain modern translations, and I'm quite confident that other versions bring this out more clearly. It speaks of grasping, and therefore they use the word robbery. But what Paul is saying, who being in the form of God did not consider it to be a matter of grasping to be equal with God. He did not consider it. He should have a grasping attitude to be equal with God. And the context bears that out. Rather than having a grasping attitude to attain to equality with God, he went the opposite direction and made himself of no reputation. The literal rendering, understand, being he emptied himself. He took upon him the form of a servant. and was made in the likeness of men. And so Jesus is saying, uh, Paul is saying, have the same mind that's in, that was in Christ Jesus, who in the form of God. Jesus, I'm not sure just the implications of all that, but there was a form of Godhead in which he lived. We mentioned this morning, the word is with God, the word was God. The Logos was with Theos, and Theos was the Logos. That's literally the way it reads. He was with God and God was the Word. The Word was with God and God was the Word. And, and, and so, I also advise you not to try to figure things out when God purposely leaves it in the realm of mystery. With God, he was God. And so he was in that form of God as the Logos. Uh, for what is your word? Is it not the expression of something that's within you? You want to communicate that to somebody else? And so you try to find the right word. And hidden in the heart of God were all the attributes of deity, and including, you know, wisdom, knowledge, love, truth, power, you could go on and on. And, and God wanted to express that. And he does so in the logos. 
just as you would express the best you know, something that's within you in a, in a word, God expressed himself in the Logos. Of course, in the Old Testament, he expressed himself so many different ways, through angelic visitation, even taking the form of an angel at times, and, uh, and other times speaking through angels, speaking through the prophets. Uh, Paul says, in divers ways and in divers manners, he's spoken to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken unto us through the Son, or literally, <coughs> two Greek words, in Son. The Son being that spoken thought of God. The Son himself being that. It's not just that Jesus spoke God's words, but that he was that full intention of everything that God had in his heart. The written word was inadequate. The, the word on tables of stone was not sufficient. It wasn't enough. The word to the prophets wasn't complete, but the Son was the complete unfolding of the heart of God. But he came down to earth to make that revelation here in the earth. So that the Logos was not really God the Son. God the Father stayed there. God the Son came here. But rather God the Father spoke a word the Logos, and that Logos, that thought of God, that very expression of God, came down to earth. There wasn't another God. It was the, the Son was the incarnate expression of God the Father. Amen. It was the expression of God's heart. Yet, coming from the Father, and then, in the fullness of redemption, going back to the Father. Now, I'm not trying to explain that. But I'd like to, and I, I, I'm not trying to be theological or doctrinal in mentioning that the Son is the expression of God the Father. I'm just, to me, it's the most beautiful thing. I grew up in Sinai School, you get the thought that there was almost like three gods in heaven and they had a discussion and, and they decided the son would be the one to come down and redeem and, and the other two persons wouldn't, you know, they'd be involved. But, and so, and we get the notion that there was a difference somehow that God remained intact but the son did that horrible that manner of suffering. And one man told me, he says, I always loved Jesus. He said, I never had any problem loving Jesus. But he said, I always had a problem loving the Father. The Father seemed so distant and so cruel and so harsh. And, and he was a good friend of mine. And, and I never said anything at the time. But I, I loved Jesus. I always loved Jesus. But I found it difficult to love the Father. But when you see that when Jesus came down to earth, it is God Almighty humbling himself in the Logos, his son. And that the Son was the expression of everything that was in the heart of the Father. And he was humbling himself and coming to us to reveal the Father as a man. Because man was made in God's image and Adam was supposed to have been that expression of the Father in the earth. But he spoiled that image through disobedience. And so we have the story of the havoc that went on in the human family awaiting the day of redemption, something that God had preordained and something that was in his plan from the beginning. Because only in redemption could the fullness of God's heart be revealed. Only in redemption could the fullness of God's heart be revealed. Those attributes of love and mercy and sacrificial giving and forgiveness. And he couldn't manifest it amongst angelic hosts. He could only manifest the fullness of the depth of his eternal heart in a man born in the earth from God in the form of God but coming down to earth emptying himself so that 
He could go into the very depths of humility on earth. Showing that God is loving and free and kind and merciful and patient and long-suffering. Whether or not you understand fully what I mean, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. And therefore, if you have any questions in your heart concerning what God might do, you just come to him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he came to earth to reveal the heart of the Father. Don't think for one minute that the Father is up there just waiting for a chance to cast you into hell, but the, the Son is here to love you. Is this is any different. He came here to express the very heart of the Father. Jesus talked about the Father, the Father so much that they come to him once they said, well, what you've been talking about, Father, show us the Father, and that's all we need. So it says, show us the Father. See, if I've been with you these three years, and you haven't realized that what I'm saying is the words of the Father, that the works I'm doing are the works of the Father. Amen. Amen. Yeah. On another occasion, the Son can do nothing of himself. Yeah. Why? If he came forth from the heart of God to reveal God in the earth, why? Because the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. We were the ones whom he would redeem, and therefore he took our flesh, our helplessness, our weakness, took upon himself even the likeness of sinful flesh, and Paul is careful to say that, the likeness of sinful flesh, because he never sinned. Yeah. It's the same kind of flesh that Adam had before he sinned. Yeah. And he had to come down into that state of humility to bring about our redemption. Yeah. And so, you better mention, you know, the, how it boggles your mind if you think out and out and out there and then how telescopes have been able to reveal some of those distant galaxies uh, so far from us that uh, our mind can't even begin to uh, we're boggled with it uh, with the infinity of God and yet one of the early uh, uh, Russian astronauts who went up there was able to come back boasting I was up there in space and God wasn't up there and it was all God up there <laughs> Do you know why? Too far away. <laughs> God Almighty revealed himself in the earth. Yeah. Down here. Yeah. Yeah. Humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a man. What the most man yeah. like yeah. in similitude of man. In every respect, except for sin. Yeah. That he might be our redeemer as well as our example. And I know that was always a great barrier to me. That, yeah, I could see that he could be my redeemer, but my example. When he was sinless, and I'm kind of sold under sin, till I realized that in the fullness of redemption, is such a dealing with sin and the carnal nature that we are as he was in the earth. Not that we have attained to it. But that redemption is not completed here in our mortal flesh until the sin principle has been crucified in the flesh. Right. And we can live and move and walk in the earth as Jesus walked when he was here. Right. Amen. Paul says, have this mind in you that is in Christ who emptied himself. He emptied himself. Poured himself out, emptied himself. I don't, I can't, I can't grasp the, the full meaning of it. I can hardly say that he, he was no longer God, but he emptied himself of every prerogative that God had. In the heavens, he, had, he was on earth as a man. He wasn't in a position half God and half man. Where, oh, I'll, I'll go and visit 
those people that are going across the lake in a boat, the storm has come up and so he walked on the water and therefore he's gone. And then on another occasion he got tired and he slept and so it must have been man. I used to have that sort of a thought. He's half God and half man and he could step out of one and into the other at will. I think many still have that concept. So I realized he emptied himself of all those prerogatives of power and authority and uh, to become a man in the earth, but a man in total dependence on the Heavenly Father. Total union and dependence on the Heavenly Father. Never stepping outside of that total dependence on the Father. And because of that, he became our Redeemer. I say because of that. Because he went to the cross. I know, but he went to the cross because he was totally dependent on the Heavenly Father for every word he spoke, every healing he performed, every miracle he performed. And totally dependent on the Heavenly Father for guidance. He knew he came to die, but he must die in the will of God. He's not just to go on and go and commit suicide. Some, you know, have that thought. He committed suicide if he came to die. Totally misunderstanding uh, the nature of redemption. As we start to point out, he came a light into the world to confront the darkness. Darkness and light won't mix. One must confront the other. And if the light is strong enough, it dies out the darkness. He came to confront the law of sin and death. He came to overcome the law of sin and death with the law of life and the function of him. It was life against death. It was righteousness and holiness against sin. It was truth against error. It was good against evil. And that's what brought his cross. Because when he came a light into the world, immediately, Evil sprang up against him. Hatred stood up against him. Simply because he was God revealing himself in a man in the earth. Jesus said, The world cannot hate you. Speaking to his own brethren. But me it hateth because I testify of it that his works are evil. Or you say, I tell the world that his works are evil. That's not what this testimony was about. He was such a living expression of the righteousness and holiness of God that by his very presence he testified of the world that it was evil and they knew it. They hated him for it. So it's not just a case of marching on Washington and saying, we don't agree with this thing. <laughs> That's not the kind of testimony that God's going to raise up. I'm not condemning them for doing that. It's not a change anything. When God has the people who are the living testimony of Jesus Christ in there, you'll be hated by the world. You think you've got freedom down here in the States and up there in Canada and because of your form of government? They tell you it's because that presence of God is not permeating the church of Jesus Christ. That's why we're not persecuted. That's why we have this false freedom. Right. They didn't do anything they want. They don't care what we do. They don't care what the church does. As long as they leave, the church leaves them alone. Yeah. They're not making any inroads mm-hmm. into right. the areas of darkness in the earth by marching, by protest, by getting involved in the political scene, getting involved in social things, They're not making any impact on the powers of darkness. I know I, I, I get into trouble saying things like that. What are you going to do with all these things? Are you just going to sit there and let them do it? Are you just going to let them do it? Aren't you going to object to it? I'm not talking about being passive. I'm talking about unless the church of Jesus Christ comes to a place where they're in union with the Son and are walking and ministering in union with the Son of God in heaven. I don't care what kind of political 
power you've got on the earth, you're not going to change it in this nation or in any other. Until we come to the place where we have power against those principalities in the heavens. Amen. They're the ones that hold the stronghold over the affairs of men. You can get in the White House or you can get in the judicial system or in, uh, in the Supreme Court. You can fill it with Christians. But until you have a voice that penetrates the heavens to shake those principalities and powers there, you're not going to change any situation Amen. in this country and in the world about it. Amen. So we're not talking negatively. And I know when I say that to you, although of course we can't do that. And so you can go on your hopeless way trying to resolve things by getting in charge of the government and you won't succeed. But when we, we come into union with him who is king of all kings and lord of all lords and do what he says, we will accomplish in the earth exactly what Jesus wants accomplished amen. for this day and hour. Yes, amen. And I qualified it for the simple reason. It's not a case that we come into union with Jesus we just go forth over the land and wipe out all the evil and establish the kingdom of God here or any other nation. I said, according to the mind and the will of the Son of God, we'll do anything he wants us to do. Because Jesus himself has been reigning on the throne of glory for 2,000 years almost, with all power in heaven and earth, and still the world is full of evil. For the simple reason that God told him to rule and reign in the midst of his enemies, until all enemies are exterminated. He gave him a mandate, you rule in the midst of your enemies. Rule in the midst of it. I'm not going to destroy all the enemies yet. It's going to be little by little. It's going to be according to my plan and purpose. But the time is coming when the Father said, all enemies are to be put under the feet of Christ. Right. And then he reveals to us that glorious mystery which we only see in part. That we are to be joined unto him in that one body. And that we are to be his hands by which we would serve him, we are to be the feet by which the gospel of peace will go to the nations. And that when the kings of this world are put under the feet of Christ, they'll be under the feet of the church because we are that those members of the body of Christ. All according to God's timetable and God's schedule. Away with the thought that once we get this great power, we're going to go forth into the earth and make things really work. Jesus himself, with all power in heaven and earth, has allowed, permitted the evil to be in this earth for these 2,000 years. And yet, all through that time, there has been a people, sometimes very insignificant, sometimes it seems that there was no real church in the earth. But all through church history, God had a people who so walked with him and learned obedience that they were able to shake those powers of darkness and to bring forth the mighty work of God that God intended for that day and hour. Yeah. Amen, Lord. It's so short of total conquest. Because God says, you rule in the midst of your enemies. We're, anticip- we're anticipating ultimate triumph. And I don't know what might immediately happen in the earth, in the church. In the next year, two or three years, we expect mighty things from God. But far be it from any, any of us to say, once that thing comes, we're going right on, we're going to subdue the whole earth for Christ. There's no room for any of that kind of boasting. God just wants the people who know his voice so clearly. And if God says to a group of people, and it doesn't have to be a large group, God will be able to speak clearly to his people. I want you to stop this whatever's going on, whatever it might be, in your city or in this nation. I want you to get together and seek my faith and intercession that you might overthrow those principalities that are controlling this horrible evil, whether it's a, abortion or homosexuality or anything else. If God indicates his will, I want you to deal with that. Then the Spirit of God hears what the Son says, and the Spirit of God communicates it to his people. And because the Spirit of God communicates it to you and I, it lays upon us the burden that's on the heart of Christ, and it comes forth in intercession. To pray to God to do that thing, and it's done. And it's happened all through church history, and it will happen again. 
Mm-hmm. I just want the church walking in union and harmony with the Son of God in the heavens. He's king. Don't think that he's coming back here to be king. He's king there in the heaven. He will be king when he comes back, but he's king now. Seven, eight, ten times there's a reference or a direct quotation or a reference uh, to the Psalm 110 where it so clearly declares that Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, was not appointed to rule on any throne in earth, because that would be inadequate. And that's what the Jews didn't understand. If you get on the throne there in Jerusalem, everything would be lovely for them. Because uh, they knew that they were God's chosen people and were under the bondage of the Roman Emperor. If Jesus gets on the throne there in Jerusalem, uh, then everything will be wonderful. And to their consternation and amazement and dismay and perplexity, when he rose from the dead, or before he rose from the dead, he says, I, I, I'm not going to be here long. I'm going back to the Father. And it devastated them. He told them just good that he was going back. It defeated for them that he, that he should go back. Because God hadn't just appointed him to subdue the Romans in Palestine. But to subdue sin in in this world and to subdue principalities and powers in the heavens. Mm-hmm. And therefore he gave him a throne higher than any throne in the earth and higher than any throne in the heavens. Mm-hmm. That he might have authority over the whole realm. Mm-hmm. Isn't that much better than if they build a throne room over there in Jerusalem or in England or here in the United States if some believe it's going to happen? Getting in the White House, what does Jesus want to get in the White House for? (laughs) When he's seated on the highest throne in God's universe. (laughs) Got authority over all that. And his people have it in union with him, but they've got to come into union with him God's way. And he shows us the way. And the mind he knew which was in Christ. Who, mm-hmm. though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to reach out after, to strive after, mm-hmm. but emptied himself. He took upon him the form of a servant, a doulos, a bond slave, mm-hmm. and was made in the likeness of men. Coming in the form of a man, there's great humiliation for God. Right. But God is a humble God. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever read that in the attributes concerning God. He's a humble God. He humbleth himself to behold the killing of man. And he humbled himself. You come down and identify with you and I. So you can see the such humility in God. Let's say it's the high and holy one that inhabited eternity. I dwell in the high and lofty place with him also that is full and of a contrite, humble and a contrite man. And so you go up there and you see the high and the holy one, but you can't really find him there. You know he's there. And what we were talking today as kids, you know, and I get it too. You just think about God, where did he come from? How big is he? And your mind goes out and out and out and, oh, I don't know, billions of miles, few more billions until you you have to stop thinking. and, And then still you're not there. The high and the Holy One, the lofty One that inhabits eternity, but He says, I dwell there, I know, but He says, with Him also that is contrite and of a humble spirit to revive the heart of the contrite one yeah. and to revive the heart of the humble. What does I dwell there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you want to find God, first of all, be sure you have a humble heart. 
And then he will show you that humble place where God is. Because God is going to reveal himself in the earth once again. And people will be traveling to and fro when they hear of great things happening. God's working over there. I've got to get down there if I can scrape up a plane fare. I've got to get there because I hear God's working there. And they go and they see God's working there, all right. But did they find God? You say, surely if I go where God's working, I'll find him. That's what Job does. Sitting there in the ash pile, devastated, lost everything. He says, I go forward, I can't find him. I go backward, I can't find him. I go to the right hand where he's working, I can't find him. I go to the left hand, I can't find him. That right where God was working, didn't find him. People can sit in a meeting where God is working. They don't see God. But then something came to Job that encouraged him. He knoweth the way that I take. And when I'm tried, I should come forth as well. And God was leading Job to a place where he would find God. And so he led him this way. God led him that way. I know you're some of your faith healers are quick to point out that Job brought his troubles on himself. Because it said he, the thing that he feared came upon him. So he brought it all in himself. Don't fear anything. Then you won't have it. But God didn't witness that way. He said, Job has spoken right concerning me. God did that with his right with Job. And, and it, what he did was in response to a challenge from the devil. He said, Job is serving you because you're good to him. When you take away what he's got, then Job will curse you to his face. If God challenged him, if God hadn't challenged him, the devil probably wouldn't have done anything about it. God literally started this thing in Job. Satan appeared one time with the other sons of God. I shouldn't say the other sons of God. He appeared with the sons of God before the throne. And God says, where are you? He's going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. God says, why are you doing that? Do you ever know the children of my servant? <laughs> <laughs> well, he says, so did he serve God for nothing? He made a rich man out of him. He's wealthy, prosperous, good family, everything lovely. God whispered that into Satan's ear for his own honor and glory. So God says, go ahead. And we won't go through the story of Job, but you know what happened. Job kept, uh, Satan kept coming back to get more and more authority, more and more authority. And God let him have it so far. Don't touch his life. It's wonderful to know that God puts his constraints on the devil. He only do what he permits him to do. He's not all powerful. He doesn't have mastery. Jesus is Lord. Amen. But perchance you feel the impact of Satan. Recognize that God let him do it. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Simon, Satan has asked for you. I'm told the gate says he has got you because he asked for you. And I pray for you that your faith will not. Well, God didn't hesitate to let Satan have a time there with Peter because he was his friend for him. He'd come out all night. And he come out the better for it. So did Job come out the better for it. <laughs> and unknown to Job, God's purpose in it all was that he might reveal himself to Job in greater things. Right. And I think unknown to many, many of God's people, many of whom I know, God is to do. People are more of it. I see them coming forward. They're sick. 
So we don't ask for suffering. We just ask the Lord to lead us in His way and to bring us to a place that we just know Him. And to do that, God may use any instrument it takes. But Lord, we want to know You better. We want to know You. So it is all over. God looked at his heavy hand up to me. He was able to say, I heard of you before, but I never saw you before. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes see your feet. And I repent in destiny. I heard of you, now I see you. I really believe that God has a revelation of himself as far beyond what we've known. We rejoice in the word. The written word, the word we hear, which Paul calls the word of healing. The word of healing. In other words, it's the word that God has given us spiritual healing to heal it. Because there's such a thing as having ears and not hearing. And we rejoice in that healing that God has given us. I know you, you have it. But there's something better. God says, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes see your feet. And therefore I abhor myself and repent in death and death. See you now. I'm talking about seeing him, and I don't mean in his vision, or I don't know really what form it will be but in a manner so clear that when we see him, we'll be able to say to one another, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. Don't think for one minute, because we're 2,000 years removed from the day of resurrection, that we lost out on that great visitation of Jesus after he rose from the dead and Peter's song. And the women saw him at the tomb and told Peter, and John went down and they, they saw the empty tomb, came back and they gathered together and the Lord appeared somewhere to Peter and to James and, and all the apostles and they saw him. He said, well, what, what a marvelous experience. He used to think I probably missed out by not having lived in that day. I believe the Lord Jesus has a revelation of himself for you and I, just as great and just as glorious as any visitation that they had in the early church. Yeah. Yeah. Paul had a visitation that was just as real to him as the one that came to Peter and John from John. Because it seems that the, it is recognized that for a man to be an apostle, he had to have been with the Lord Jesus and have seen him. Paul wasn't around those days. Yet he was made to be an apostle. Paul, as Paul said, writing to the church here, but the Lord Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he was seen of the apostles and then 500 brethren at once. But he says, I saw him too. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him. I saw him, he said, just as really as Peter saw him. Yeah. And he took that as a credential for his apostleship because he said, well, Peter's an apostle and he saw Jesus. Paul said, I saw him too. Yeah. <laughs> saw that same Jesus appearing in glory the light with which he's enthroned in glory. God let that light come down to earth and he saw him as truly as Peter saw him. And that was after the resurrection. It wasn't at the first appearing of Christ. It wasn't the second coming of Christ. It was in between. There was that glorious appearing of the Christ. And so if he did it once, he can do it twice and he can do it again. And I believe that before that open manifestation of the Lord from heaven, which is certainly going to happen. There's nothing to hinder him from appearing to God's people any time he wants to. Right. Amen. That same Jesus. Amen. And I anticipate that. Yes, Lord. He walked with the disciples there prior to his ascension. I believe he will walk with them once again prior to his coming again. And the same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. 
He was with them before he went, communing with them, talking with them, revealing himself, and went. I believe he'll come back and reveal himself to them and talk with them before he's openly manifested to the inhabitants of the earth. But we have to be prepared to see him. We have to be humble to see him. Humble shepherds saw him. In a major, and knew he was the king of Israel. Wise men came to me. They were not very intellectual. They're humble. They came from the east. They saw his star. Where is he? And they called the scribes and the Pharisees together to inquire where Messiah was to be born because Herod was afraid of another king was due to be born. Due to be born. Oh, they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for that's what is written in the prophets, and thou Bethlehem, Judah, of Ephrata, and Bethlehem of Bethlehem of Ephrata, thou art, though the least of the tribes of Israel, unto thee shall come for the governor who shall rule my people Israel. Yeah. Head the scriptures right in his right in their tongue. That's all right. And so he told the wise men to go down to Bethlehem and find them. The tribe didn't want it. And that's strange. They weren't humble. If their hearts were humble, they would have said the Messiah was born in Bethlehem, he told us. That's so fits to him. So he grew up in their midst and they never saw him. But while still a babe, he was taken into the temple. And there were prepared hearts, prepared hearts, and they saw him. Simeon saw him. Anna saw him. Mary and Joseph, of course, and Mary, they saw him. And spake of him to all those in the temple area, milling around in the temple area, so busy with their religion, bringing the goats and the bullocks and the pigeons, and dedicating their babies and everything carrying on. It's a glorious institution, and we've got a great church to know see what's going on here. The Messiah was there in the midst and they never saw him. Right. Simeon came along and picked him up and said, See the Messiah, let me die now, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> he literally said that. Right. I think Rawson Spouse pointed out that it was a burden of him. And uh, because God had said, You're not going to die for you, see the Messiah. Well, apparently he's getting older and older and getting more feeble and wished he could die, but he, he couldn't die. <laughs> die because God put a burden on you. can't die till you see the Messiah. <laughs> and then he says, Now, Lord, uh, the word is that spotted from which we get the word death spot. Not that in recalling God Almighty a death spot in the way we use it, but it does signify it. Uh, an authoritarianism. You put me under this burden. You gave me this vision that one day I would see the Messiah. Now, Lord, I've seen your, the salvation of the Lord, the light that you have prepared to lighten the Gentiles. Now let me go and die in peace. <laughs> Release me. <laughs> Release me, Lord. I fulfill my duty in the earth. As oh, Father Christ. Hallelujah. Because God. not only with the vision of living to see the Messiah, but with any vision you have that God given, be it of a lower plane or a higher plane, I don't care what category you might put it in, because God does give an expecting people vision and hope. And we only pray that God will increase and enlarge and purify it and clarify that vision, that it might be the vision he wants us to have. Yeah. Yeah. But with that vision, there comes with it a burden that you must carry. It sounds good when you see it, when you hear it. It's great. It says, oh. Lord, my son, thou shalt be a great prophet of the Lord. Thou shalt stand and prophesy my, you know, and get that great prophet. <laughs> But, uh, with that vision will come a great trial and oh. fire or testing ask Ezekiel ask Jeremiah 
That's Isaiah. That's John the Baptist. That's any two prophets of the Lord. They didn't ask to be a prophet. They gladly laid down their ministry any time. Jeremiah later said, He means that he's going to bring forth the people walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Great to say. But to do that, he means that they're the humble themselves as he did. No matter what their calling is, no matter how great they might be in the eyes of men, a prophet that can speak forth words that reveal the secrets of men, a healer that can heal the sick and raise the dead, and uh, no matter how great it might seem in the eyes of men, God says, that ministry must humble himself within a bone tree. We're in the likeness of man by birth, so we won't have to be made in the likeness of man, but be made in the likeness of bond children. Bond slaves. Regardless of your calling. The Apostle Paul would say, Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Paul to be in the past. You see, big in our eyes. Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I therefore call the prisoner of the Lord. The prisoner of the Lord. He took the humble position. You say, God led him that way. I know, but the reason God was able to lead him that way is because Paul had said, like his master, Lord, I will follow you. Let this mind in you which is also in Christ Jesus. You read that and you stumble over it because you say, Lord, I'd like to. I'd like to be humble and meek and lowly as my master. Help me to do that. Show me the way. And so then he begins to show us the way. And he reveals to us that he's the way. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Life, that's what we want. Truth, that's what we want. Well, to find truth and to find life, we must know Jesus as the way. In other words, we must walk in his way. If we're going to know peace, if we're going to know love, we must learn to walk in his way. And as we walk in his way, God's way brings us down to humanity. Because God's a humble God and God wants to walk on earth with man, but he will not walk with the proud or the spunker. Humble thyself to walk with God. No hymn that we used to sing in three twenty times. Give it all him. Humble thyself to walk with God. Just as the stream finds a bed that is lowly, so Jesus walks with the pure and the holy. Cast out thy pride, and with heartfelt contrition, humble thyself to walk with God. We talked about the river of God that God's going to release, a river that flows through the land. Yeah. It's going to flow in low places. And all his big out the Lord. Yes. Right. And so Jesus said, have this mind. Paul said, have this mind that is in Christ Jesus. Speak out the lowly part. The apostles argued amongst himself, he's going to be the greatest. I don't know if Jesus heard it physically or heard it in the spirit. But they were lagging behind a little when they drew up close. He said, what was that you're talking about? He <laughs> took a little child and said in the midst, he would be great amongst you, let him be a sister of the time. He would be great in the kingdom of God, let him be servant of all. Let him take the lowest position. You come into the banqueting house, you don't know where you're to sit, well, go down to the end of the table, sit there at the back. And then, if the Lord sees fit to promote you, he'll call you up. Take the Lord's position. Further here to explain, just before leaving, 
Well, yes, but that man can be used to mighty as God. A man has proved the end of their life what it's tried to be, or somehow they seem to get away from that original humility they had. Then it's evident enough that we've got to walk in God's way. Well, haven't they walked in God's way? Who am I to judge? But it must be that somewhere along the line, they listened to the voice of the country. Because they had a great ministry, we've got to keep it going. If God is saying, let it dry up, and fold up, oh, that must be the voice of the devil. God doesn't do things like that. A man has a great ministry of healing, and God comes to him and says, You've been healing the sick now these many years. I'm going to lay your side as far as that ministry is concerned. Keep my faith and walk with me and learn obedience. I wonder if God has said that, whispered that to many of these, some of these who have fallen. And they were not prepared to do it. I know prophets that went to some of these outstanding leaders. Two prophets. And all went to some of them, warned them that they were on the wrong road. They didn't listen. So God does give warning. Yeah. He gives opportunity to humble himself. Yeah. And by his grace, he has given us the ability to humble ourselves. Because he leads us in the way he wants us to go. And if we walk in the way he wants us to go, and avoid the pressure that because we have something from God, we could enlarge our ministry, and avoid that, avoid that pressure, God will be faithful. He leads you and I in the right way. And so before our Lord Jesus, before the Father permitted him to go forth in ministry, for one thing, he was 30 years of age. And I'm not saying that's a pattern in any sense of the word. Uh, nevertheless, he was mature. Even though he had the gift of God. Even though he was God's gift in the earth. Yeah. Even though as a young boy he was able to confound the doctors of the law with his wisdom. It wasn't the Father's time for him to go forth and minister. I've always felt very sorry when I hear of some young child that is in gifted of the Lord. The great gift of the Spirit. Like a young man, I, I heard it back when I was younger. A real prophet, as a young lad. And they organized his itineraries and had him preach all over the nation, drawing thousands of people. Because he was a prophet, the end of God, had his true prophetic ministry. Maybe God will raise him up yet, as far as I know, and we still believe him. But the Son of God, went back and went to work with his father until he was 30 years of age when the father released him. And then he gave to John the Baptist the word that when you see one coming and you baptize him and as you baptize him the holy dove will come down from heaven and rest upon him. That's the one that I sent you to introduce to Israel. He's the one. And John recognized him even as he saw him walking up. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And he baptized him, and the dove came down from heaven, and the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Did Jesus go from there to hold these big evangelistic crusades? Because he was anointed with this mighty power in the land. He was driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Yeah. God is going to lay upon his son the greatest ministry this world has ever seen. Or ever will see. The ministry of Messiah, the Son of God. 
But because he came as a man, he had to live as a man, totally dependent on the Father. Couldn't rely on his deity. He laid aside all that. What shall I say? I don't know how to express it. The prerogative, the deity, to live as a man on the earth in union with the Father, that he might be a pattern and example for you and I. To show us who are not divine. He, he came to the place where he put himself in our position, not only as a man, but as a bond slave. And a bond slave is one who simply listens to the call of his master, does nothing except what the Father says. Doesn't try and do all sorts of things and then is subject to the correction of the Father, but waits for the Father, for the Master to tell him what to do. Yeah. A bond slave. Right. Stand before God as a bond slave. To hear what the Father has to say. Jesus was that. Paul became that also. And until we become bond slaves of the Lord, God prevents us from going out into any great ministry. Mm-hmm. I figure that's much of the problem. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I got this gift from God. I can heal the sick. Away I go to change the world without having been driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You say, well, a man, he can't go into the wilderness and find that. I'm just saying that if he has this knowledge of God and this understanding of his word, he will say to God, God, don't send me forth in ministry until you have proved me and found me. Okay. Don't send me forth in ministry until you approve me and find me. Without knowing these truths that I'm speaking as a young man, I did pray to the Lord, Lord, I know you have a ministry for me, but don't let me go forth if you know I'll make difference until I'm ready. Uh, that means maybe people know you. <laughs> and I was ready and willing to go. But I still say that. And I go out very little. I thank the Lord for when he does release me because I feel there's a purpose. And I think I know his voice and I pray that I'll always know his voice. Because I like going out when he sends. But I got frustrated at times when I went, when I thought maybe he was sending and wasn't sure. And I don't want to go through that, that way. I want to know when he sings. I want to know his voice clearly. And I, I felt I heard his voice to come here, so I was coming with anticipation. But it's not that I'm trying to get on the road traveling and ministry. I, I say, God, don't send me out. You know what pitfalls that are there? I don't want to go out, Lord, if I'm going to make shipwreck at this late day. I nearly made it younger years. I could have made shipwreck very easily. But I started out in ministry and I couldn't find that, oh, that anointing. I couldn't find that pleasure of God in it. And decided I'd go back to work and I stayed at my job. But I could see if I'd have tried to continue on, I could have very easily made total shipwreck. Because of the temptations round about you, if you're not walking in God, I don't think ministry is a place to make you spiritual. Ministry is not the place to go if you want to be spiritual. You stay in your home church and seek God and love Him and do His will and learn His voice very clearly until you're ready. Until God's ready. Until there's a standing by His Spirit that you're aware of the voice of God. And God will be pleased, and He knows where you are. People trying to prod me all my life to get out and answer because you've got this word for the church, and you know it. I say, God knows where I am. (laughs) (laughs) And this one man, friend of mine, he used it against me. What's George doing? Oh, he's up there in Canada, carpentering. He told me God knows where he is, and God wants it. <laughs> but I didn't say it that with that thought or with that attitude. There's only one thing I ever had in mind to do in my life, and that was to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I don't want to go forth and make 
unprepared as you and anointed as you and led of your spirit, I still say that. I want to be led of the spirit of God wherever I go. And I want to be confident that God is leading. He gave me this verse one time as I anticipated ministry several years ago and I was out for two months and I thought maybe now is the time when I'll be out full time. And, uh, and I was out for two months and came back and first and didn't see really the depth of anointing. Didn't see any particular fruit from it. Not that that always matters. I didn't feel confident that I, that uh, it was a profitable thing that I did. And I had left my job to do it. And came back and the boss heard I was home and phoned me and took me back into the cabinet there. From then on, I don't think I'll be anxious to do that. And that's why I said to my friend, God knows where I am. And uh, I want to be hearing from him, and I'm uh, glad to go, but uh, he knows he's got my address. And uh, someone says, well, maybe you should be out there, and you can't hear God. He, he wants you to go out, I'm sure, but you can't hear his voice. And the answer is so clear. If I can't hear his voice telling me where to go, I don't want to stand before the people That's right. and declare God's way to them. That's right. If I can't hear his voice leading me where to go, I don't want to go out minister. He made himself of no reputation, making himself to put on him the form of a servant, and made him the likeness of men. This is the pathway that Paul says, I want you Philippians to take. And compare that with any other pathway that you have in mind that will lead to success, that will lead to the fulfillment of your vision, that will lead to an enlargement of your vision. Thoughts will come, people will come. The tempter will come to show you how you can enlarge what you have. Isn't it logical to enlarge what you have? To increase what you have? Isn't this a day of big things? Isn't God a big God doing big things? God is a big God doing big things. But the big things are insignificant in the eyes of the people. (laughs) And the great things in the eyes of the people are insignificant in the mind of God. What are great things? Is John the Baptist a great, a great prophet? Yes. How do you know? But if he hasn't said so, and you just heard that there was a John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, calling the people to repentance, and just had that written account of it, would he go down in his history as the greatest prophet that ever lived? He performed no miracle. He didn't go around holding his things. He went out in the wilderness and camped out there. (laughs) (laughs) It was the process that I threw out there. (laughs) Somehow the word spread around. There was a strange process out there in the wilderness and people began to go down to see. He said, what did you go down to see? A leaf shaking in the wind? Prophet? Interesting. Among those born of women, there has not arisen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. We're quick to add that least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's true, but there was never a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Jesus had to remind his disciples of that. It didn't appear that way. He started to get disciples around him, and all of a sudden he started to leave him. Because he said, here's the Lamb of God, and he started to lead Jesus, lead John to follow Jesus. Right. And he comes to him, aren't you concerned about this, John? He says, I must be peace. Mm-hmm. But he must be peace, in peace. And Jesus said he was the greatest prophet of all. He had the right attitude. I must become small, that he might become big. I must come to nothing, that he might be everything. Mm-hmm. The Son of God said, of mine own self, I can do nothing. 
as I hear I judge, my judgment is just. But because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. The Son of God said that. So it mattered not to Jesus that he preached to 15, 20,000 people as he did on occasion. Or go and sit down at a well at Samaria and minister to one poor old devastated lady that was there. But God arranged to be there when he got there. He got the action. It's the same to him. Because in either case, it is the will of the Father. To do the will of the Father and to know that the Father is pleased with it ought to be our greatest joy, our greatest pleasure. God, no doubt, looked down and saw that that was a great meeting you had there for that old man in his battle. I think God would take notice of that. Because God takes notice of little things. The people do in his name. Because we're a people that want to do big things for God. That are big in the eyes of men. God wants us to do things that are big in his eyes, whether they're big in the eyes of men or not. Right. Right. And so as he stood there in the temple doorway and the people were throwing their money into the treasury and a little lady came along, a, a little woman. She didn't have much. She threw in too much. Jesus gave his attention to it. Jesus gave the attention of the disciples to this little woman that put in too much. The other said, this is what about it? She put in more than all the rest. <laughs> Going in the gold coin. She put in most of all. That's God's estimation of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's carry God's estimation. Because God's idea of greatness is far above our thoughts. It's amazing. You can hardly believe it. How far is God's estimation above ours? Just by natural reason. I mean, the natural reason we have is this natural man. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And my ways above your ways. That's the chasm that exists between God's way and God's thought and your way and my way as man sees it. The thing is, keeps it stuck. You go down to any Christian bookstore and you can find all kinds of books on how to be a successful Christian, a successful uh, leader, a successful pastor, a successful apostle or whatever. If you want to know the roadway to success, go down to the Christian bookstore and it's flooded with books along that line. If you want to know the pathway to success in the mind of God, read this passage over and over. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He did not think it to be a thing to grasp after, to be equal with God, but emptied himself took upon him the form of a bond slave, was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man who humbled himself. So how can I humble myself? Just walk in God's way. You know, if we knew a good speaker of humbling ourselves, I think they do it. They beat ourselves with a flip, or uh, walk on fire, or uh, put stones in your shoes, or... <laughs> They used to do in the Catholic Church, to, you know, to do something to make yourself humble. But if you walk in God's way, He leads you in a way that leads to humility. So when He led them out of the wilderness, on the way to Canaan, He led them in the pathway that would humble them. They thought they were on their way to Canaan, and they were. Uh, but uh, what's the 40 years all about then? And that's the thing that bothered them, tormented them. No cane in here, no figs, no pomegranates, no flowing rivers, no fruit trees, no houses built. As God promised, a waste and howling wilderness is what Moses called it. And after it is over, God tells them why he led them that way. The wilderness that you and I are called to go through, be it long or short, that's all in God's choosing and all according to his plan for your life. 
But it's the way intended of the Lord to humble you to the point where you'll hear his voice so clearly. Having been obedient to walk in his way, he'll lead you in pathways that which, which will produce humility. That's right. Thank you, Lord. And so God said 40 years later, I have led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And I fed you with manna, and I caused you to hunger, that you might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. He led them that way to humble them, to prove them, to know what was in their hearts, to manifest what was in their hearts, not to torment them, but to show what was there that he might deal with it, that he might prove them, humble them, feeding them with man all along the way, that they might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord that he lives. So God is leading you that way so that you'll know his voice and know his word. His living word, the word that proceeded. Good to have this word which is written. But God's intention is to take this word which is written and make it alive till it proceeded. Present tense. But the word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord that man lived. This is the way Jesus went. Learning obedience. Became obedient how far? Unto death. What kind of a death? Even the death of the cross. That's the pathway to the throne. Oh, you, you just wonder what people are reading them. You get all these thoughts of we're the church of Christ, we're going to take over the kingdom, we're going to not stay the throne under him, we're going to sit there in the government places, we're going to take over the White House, we're going to get Christians there in the Supreme Court, you're going to do nothing of the kind if you're going to come to God's kingdom. You're going to go the way of the cross if you're going to come to God's kingdom. And the cross will be one that the world about you that you're trying to reform it's going to form for you to die on. If you're truly that witness to Christ in the earth, you do that. They will make that cause for you and I. Upon which we will suffer disappointment, perplexity, trial, testing, out of which will come the authority of his kingdom. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. Oh, how strange that people can somehow get those crazy thoughts. We just, because we've got the doctrine of the kingdom of God's forth and going to speak it in Jesus' name. This is how Jesus said. You think you're going to get it an easier way. Therefore, said Paul, if we suffer with him, we shall also learn from him. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The reason Jesus is enthroned in the heavens with all power in heaven and earth. It's not simply because he lived a good life here on earth, because he was the Messiah from heaven, because he healed the sick or raised the dead, because he evangelized the crowd and preached, preached good tidings to those who were in prison and set the prisoners loose. All of these things he did because of his anointing that he had. But the reason he was exalted to the throne was because he humbled himself and learned obedience to the Father. In learning obedience, he became a bondservant, a bond slave. And in learning obedience, he became obedient unto death, the very end, and not an ordinary death, the death of the cross. 
that's why God exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. He wasn't exalted because he was the Son of God, because he was the Messiah, because he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords by divine election. He was exalted to the throne room because he learned the Father's way, walked the Father's way, learned to be, and humble himself, went down as low as any man could have gone by way of learning obedience. Therefore, therefore, wherefore, God has highly exalted him. Also, let this mind be in your heart. And I can't just somehow tell my mind to do it. But I can't walk in obedience. I can do it with faith. Thank God is faithful to let us know the way we should walk if we really want to know. But having been saved and filled with the Spirit and getting a few gifts, we feel now I've got to, I've got to plan my life and I, I, I want to get in ministry and I want to be a successful minister and I want to do this and, you know, and I heard young children say, I want to have a ministry like old Robert and then they just come there. I want to have a ministry like him. Don't have any such ideas. Because God has made each one of us this thing. Creation of God. I know in teaching about the body of Christ, we think of the beauty of the oneness and all that, and that's true. Uh, but the difference between this and just a society is that, or a, a commune or communism, is this that each member is distinctly the creation of God. It's distinct this, distinct ministry, distinct place in the earth and in the body. We're not seeing too much of that. But that's what it's all about. And before it's over, we're going to see every member of the family of God. There's something so special and distinct from the hand of God that every other member will recognize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quite a ways from there yet. That's what God has in mind. That there be no emulation, no striving to be something that you're not. No vision to be anything but to do the will of God. And recognizing Christ and how Christ moves in other lives and as they will recognize the Christ living in your life. We long for that. But it can only come as God tempers the body together. We make way for it and we're pleased to see from time to time a little of the gifting of God's Spirit and the congregation. Uh, but uh, the Bible says it will come with the tempering of the body. The tempering of the body together with the whole holy oil of his anointing. God has tempered the bodies together, giving more abundant honor to those parts of the body, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members might have the same care one for another. Mm-hmm. We've had large movements started up, and some of them still existed, showing how to eradicate schism in the body of Christ. If you come under certain system, the the church is Christmas because you've got leaders at the top and leaders below them and below them and below them and the people under them and if you follow this particular pattern it'll eradicate the division and schism in the body of Christ. God has a way that's very simple and he says when he puts his honor on the individual members in the body and you know God has given you this this is God's gift to me you don't desire to be anything else but this this thing that God has given you because then you'll have a care one for another. You've got something that you can minister to somebody else. I think God started to do that, but let's look for the fullness of it. For God has tempered the body together, giving more abundant honor to those parts which lack that there be no schism in the body, no schism in the body, but that the members will have the same care one for another. A caring church. Church full of the love of Christ, each one caring for the other. That person towards that end. This is the way. Take the humble position before God. Ask Him to lead you in this way and He'll lead you into the humility of God. May the Lord bless you with your heart.
I believe you have to acknowledge that we heard the word from God, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, oh dear God, if I'd had somebody to tell me that when I was a young man, the grief and the things that would have kept me from, but even that worked out for good. Um, I just think of all the tragedy out here in, in the land of, of Christianity, all the havoc, all the shipwreck that, that could be averted if, if this knowledge of, of becoming a bond servant is, is known, really known, really believed. Amen? Uh, what a one other, are you writing a book about this? Some of this? It's like there's a book here. Uh, well, there's, there's things here though that's not, brother. I did the same. But there's some things here that, that I've made a book. Just, I, mean, I just put, I want to say that. I, I think there's some subjects there that there's a book in. <laughs> so, amen. I just want to mention that. I, you know, I know you'll be love of the Lord in it. Uh, but the Lord wanted me to say something, and I don't want to take away I have to, the word. That, that's impossible. But the Lord's been speaking to me to say to you to be, be careful that you, you don't strain it on that. And swallow a pill. We know there's giants in the land, right? There are false apostles and prophets. And a lot of God's dear people are so afraid that they can't enter in. They can't ever let their weight down. And the problem is, is they don't trust the Holy Ghost for them. You've got to trust that Holy Ghost that's come into you. He said, he said what? He would lead you into all the truth to testify of that which is of God. And you've got to trust that inward witness, that inward voice. You know what? Well, the way I've always heard truth that God's given to me, I've heard it in my innermost being. And my spirit has leaped and done handsprings and shouted in the burning sensation of God. And it, sometimes when I was hearing truth, my mind was saying, this don't agree. With what I've been taught. This don't agree with what I've heard. This isn't mainstream Christianity. And what this leads to is confusion and people not letting their weight down in God, not ever putting their hands to the plow. Confusion, always off balance. It's like sometimes God will lead you to a place, but because of your suspicion and so afraid of being deceived that you strain in a gnat and you swallow a camel. And you can be deceived. Amen. It's like the children of Israel, my brother mentioned, God led them by, by a pillar of fire and a cloud, right? Pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And when he, he went to seek out a place for them, didn't he? But when that cloud or that pillar stopped, what did Israel know? Camp out. Now can you imagine the whole camp of Israel, three million or whatever it was, what, wandering around every day saying, I wonder if this is it. Can I really, can I really put my pen up here? Can I really get my suitcases out and really unstop? <coughs> Never a break. Well, what did they do? When that cloud stopped by the leading of God, what did they do? They set up the tabernacle, that they teach their sins by order. God had an order of how they would be sent. And so when God leads you, trust the Holy Ghost, and then let all of your weight down in Him in that thing that God is telling you to do. And when he's telling you to step out, he knows where you are. And when he's ready to move, he's well able to tell us, isn't he? Yeah. This is a tragedy. Like one brother said, the church growth in America is just big, changing things. Amen? So I, I encourage you, because I know a lot of you are skeptical, even uh, this church, and you may be skeptical, brother, or not. Is this a man of God? I mean, I, I'm not here to defend myself. I can't. I'm not here to prove anything about Brother Warnock. We can't. But you that's a spirit that's on you. And then put your, let your whole rest in God. In that. He will not let you down. He will not lie to you. If you simply obey him and love him and are sincere, he, he will not let you down. He will not let you. I'm a testimony to the grace of God. I'm a testimony to his faithfulness and his teaching power and his leadership. Because in the beginning, God, I want to say this, brother, that God gifted. The times God would, would confirm every word I said would find fault. 
And I thought I was ready to go. And God in his mercy pulled the rug out from under me. It wasn't that he told me to lay it down. I didn't have no choice. God just pulled the rug out from under me and took it and put it in a safe deposit box. Well, I could not. Men wanted to promote me. I had people offered to take me around the world. They would bring auditoriums for me. And it was so exciting and oh, man, you know what, you know what I mean? You want to go. Brother Robert Tom, one of the greatest prophets I've ever known, was Tom. I know he didn't mean to do it, but he did God. He said, come, Tom, go with me. And I wanted to quit my job. Oh, I came that, I don't know, every time he came, I was coming that close. Between my job. And I would have missed that. I would have missed that. But the Holy Ghost within me, that faithful witness, will always say, oh. and I, can do it. I don't know why. But thank God, because I tell you, I was a loaded shotgun. And I'd have blown people's heads off in my teeth. And I would have, I, I don't, I don't guess about it, I know I would have been shipwrecked, and I would have made multitudes of people shipwrecked. I'm so thankful tonight that he kept me from my father in my years. It's, it's good to wait on God. I didn't mean, you know it's going to be this long. But thank God, every how long it takes. As a young man, I used to grieve, I, sometimes I didn't like to read about Moses because I'd hear those words for him. <laughs> I'm here 30 about Jesus and 30 about Joseph and I, I hear this and I think, oh God, I'm 26 years old. I thought, good God, 30 years, 40 years, I'd be an old codger. What's in an old codger? I'm not being, because now I am an old codger, okay? <laughs> but I saw something in the Lord. God told me Moses. A meek man, most humble man, by God's own word, but what? On the face of the earth. And God showed me that a man or woman that will wait on God, that when God does bring them forth, prepared and equipped and clothed with his authority, look what Moses did. Not Moses, but God what? In Moses. He brought down the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, didn't he? One day. Never to rise again in one day. And I saw that. I saw, dear God, look what... And I saw, I saw, oh God, I saw by the grace of God. One man that's waited on God and comes forth only as God's bidding can do more in one day than 10 billion of these so-called people who waited and just come to hell. Mm-hmm. And that's not a past enemy. That's not a cop out. That's the ways of God. So I want to tell you what, what God's speaking. You know, and we're not saying you to come here. If God sends you here, great. But if He sends you here, put your whole weight down. Connect yourself to us. Not to me, but to Him. Amen. 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 And so I, I, I just feel I had to say that. Amen. <laughs> and so learn. There's wisdom here. Learn. I, I pray that the young people will hear this word. I pray that you get these tapes. Because I don't think you hear all of this in one city. Unless you've really been prepared. If you've been one who's got a long time in hearing, you might have hear all of this. But get these tapes and hear and hear and hear. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's stand. Amen. It, it's also in our hearts to sing that song again that the brother brought up in Psalm 27, verse 4, King James Version. One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired of the Lord. 